year at Battlefield. Um, I also manage the Artist of Residence program, and uh, I'm very happy and pleased to have our 2021 Artist in Residence, Lisa Samia, back with us uh, for this anniversary. Uh, this was something that was a long time in coming. In fact, uh, going back to last year when she was here during her residency in October, we were talking about this. Um, and I'm very happy we were able to bring it to fruition. And um, Lisa is the author of several volumes of poetry, as many of you know. Uh, she's got a new one that is set to come out in the spring. And a lot of her poetry focuses on the experience of those that lived through a uh, war. And, um, and um, her poetry largely focuses on the experiences of those who lived through the war. <coughs> and it really connects very nicely, bless you, um, to a lot of what we were, we were talking about this weekend in regard to the 160th anniversary of the Second Battle of Manassas. This was a battle where 23,000 people were killed, wounded, captured, or missing, and many thousands more participated. Um, and they still, in a way, live on this battlefield. I was thinking about this last night after we were kind of hanging here in the stone house and it was getting dark. Um, a lot of people talk about feeling a presence here. And I think it's something um, universal that we all recognize that something of great importance happened here and there was a great struggle here. There was also great triumph here as well. Um, and so uh, in introducing Lisa, I wanted to share a poem from uh, the Battle of Second Manassas. This was written by a, a family member or a friend of a soldier that was killed up along the unfinished rail cut on August 29th. Um, his brother exchanged several letters with the commander of the 11th Massachusetts, William Blaisdell, and Blaisdell informed the brother that the body of his brother may never be found, um, that there was a report of him being carried off when he passed away, but that was it. He was going to become an unknown. And Lisa, uh, her poetry really tries to give a voice to those unknowns, those nameless, those faceless. Um, so I wanted to share this poem to uh, Lieutenant William Rogers Porter at Bull Run. Tread softly passing here. This is a soldier's grave. Press lightly. This is sacred soil. Here sleeps a hero brave. Speak gently passing here. Yes, talk in tender tone. Because here our brother shed his blood far from his happy home. Flow softly passing here, you winds that sigh and moan. Our tender hearts are bleeding now for those he loved at home. Touch gently passing here, the leaves that fall now. Move not a twig or stone, for this is holy ground. Mm. And Lisa is going to expound on that. Um, so without further ado, here is Lisa Samuel. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the National Park Service of Manassas for the honor of inviting me here to the 160th commemoration of the Second Battle of Manassas. My poetry essay books, as many of you know, The Nameless and Faceless of the Civil War and The Nameless and Faceless Women of the Civil War earned me artist in residency through National Parks Arts Foundation, National Park Service Gettysburg Poetry for 2020, and of course, AIR, uh, National Park Service Manassas, um, in October of 2021. These books are a collection of 28 poems and 28 historical essays on the Civil War. We know that not everyone who witnessed and experienced the Civil War made it into the history books. What of all those unknowns? For the first time, by combining the rhyme and the narrative of poetry with actual Civil War events, a lost voice of history comes forth to share their story and their suffering, a place where I always like to think the humanity of history come together to share their experiences. And there's no north or south in these collections. You must be like, what? <laughs> there's no border states. There's no governance of politics. For it is my belief, especially in this collection as it relates, that suffering has no boundaries. 
The narrator in these poems is, recurring, is recounting a historical scene of the Civil War. I expanded this concept by adding through detailed research of anguish of not just by soldiers, but civilians, doctors, nurses, political figures, and all who felt the vast misery of the Civil War. These poems give a voice uh, and a place to tell their tale of compassion, life, death, agony, and grief as a reminder to the world that they did not die in vain. And we also remember, we all know that the Civil War, when we study it and read it, is about generals and flanking maneuvers and who was in what corps and who won that battle. But now we're going to come down to when we see those figures, when we say 15,000 men were wounded, injured, wounded and missing and died. We're going to take that concept and this is what's going to come forth. We're going to be thinking of all those unknowns. First poem I would like for you to read today, and all of these poems, unless otherwise indicated, will be in my new collection. This is called My Brother Jacob. The inspiration behind this poem is a story that many families of the Civil War endured. Brothers had fought with brothers, fathers, uncles, and cousins. And this is a story of two unknown brothers from Centerville, Virginia, who started out right here in the Battle of Manassas and ended up on the field of Gettysburg. Two unknowns? and yet only one would come home. A heartbreaking story, I am sure, was repeated thousands of times during the Civil War. My brother Jacob. I will tell you a story right here and now of my brother Jacob, I do avow. You see, it was the spring of 61 when first we knew secession had rung. And my younger brother Jacob, you see, sprang to enlist to defend Virginia, if ever be. I will never forget his fervor and such that asked me to join him, oh, it was too much. For you see, it was me and him and my ma at home. My pa done died, it was just us alone. My poor ma, she took me aside and told me with all of her pride, see here, Caleb, as the oldest of my sons, I don't want you to go either, God's will, thy will be done. But go you must, but for the reason I give, watch out for your brother and help him live. For tis you we have always relied, and this too I'm afraid we must abide. But not to worry about me, my son, she said with a smile. I'll be waiting for you both. I'll be here a while. And so you must go, you must defend our little farm here to the end. With that said, Jacob and I took our leave. The last sight of my ma caused me to grieve. And in battles that we stayed true, Manassas, Antietam, Fredericksburg, to name a few. Jacob and I, well, we stayed together every time, shoulder to shoulder, it would us find. After two years in battles that bled, comrades killed so much bloodshed that Jacob and I did survive, you see, but it was Gettysburg that would consume me. It was day three on this impossibly hot day. I was with Jacob in the tree line with all of Virginia, I say, waiting for our commander General Pickett to order us men into the battle and out into the glen to march in the open field about a mile or so, they say, to face the Union artillery along the way. I turned to Jacob as we waited to go and told him, stay close, brother, for I know this day's battle, I believe, will bring much sorrow, I fear, for all of us men and our loved ones' tears. Jacob smiled at me with his usual grin, said, come on, brother, we will win. Then the silence was sliced with the battle din and roar as General Pickett did state it was for. Remember men, you are from old Virginia, I heard him say, and so the drums of battle ordered us on our way. Not a sound from the ranks was heard, only the beating drums that was stirred. And so we marched Jacob right by my side. I wanted to grab him to run and to hide, for in that moment great explosions were all around. The Union cannon was the most deafening of sound and great groans and cries from the men as one by one they disappeared from the glen. And yet we kept marching, kept going, you see, to the copse of trees where the Union may be. Then it seemed all of my life stopped in this place, a great blast near me, hot to my face. I must tell you, I do not remember what happened then. I woke up and lay there for what or how long or when, and realized as I raised my head the battle was over and so many dead in fields of sweet clover. I carefully inspected myself to be sure I was all right, only knocked out in this horrific fight. 
I rose to my feet and panic struck my heart. Where was Jacob? I could not part. It was then I spied him, very near a group of some dead. I went to rouse him and move him away from this hot bed. I knelt beside him, knocked out like me. I cried, Jacob, come on, follow me. Wake up, wake up, it's time to go. We will fight another battle, this I know. I don't know how long I tried to revive my brother on that field, only when the ambulance came and told me to yield. My brother's body to be buried post haste. No time to mourn, no time to waste. My blood froze even through the blazing heat. My brother's body at my feet. There'd be no going home, not for him. I cried and then cried in the haze and the din and thought of my ma and the promise I could not keep. I tried ma to keep him safe, I said and did weep. But God Almighty had other plans for him. This we prayed not to see. For your sweet boy, Jacob, Ma, he was not meant to be. This next poem is called Beyond the Battle Din. The inspiration for this poem is the actual backstory of how General Thomas J. Jackson received the name Stonewall. This from the First Battle of Manassas in July of 1861. Again, as we combine poetry and history. Beyond the Battle Din. I will tell you now as plain as I can say of what I saw on that battlefield that hot July day. Beyond the war and din and fire, when men fell, it was so dire. I came to Manassas with my regiment, I state, with our General Jackson leading our fate. And in that moment, I felt for just a second or two like Caesar's legions of ancient Rome and bid adieu. Then I heard General B as he stood with his men as they could. See, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall, rally behind the Virginians was his call, and the name would be forever, I state, to be known as Stonewall in his looming fate. As I heard the fife, the drum, the call to kill, and so we moved towards the enemy to fulfill the order we heard from Jackson, I state, to yell like furies and quicken the gate. Double quick, I heard someone shout, and so my pace quickened without a doubt. The soldier next to me seemed so young, his face bloomed with dew that clung, like a morning glory in the dawn of day, not for this soldier as he fell in the fray. I could not stop, I kept up my fire, roars of cannon like the funeral pyre. As we kept up on a furious pace, I saw so many fall in one place. And what of those lost young souls whose stories would never be told? and the ones begging for help as they lay upon the field where their cries were not heard, and so they did yield to the Almighty to ease their pain. And what of them, I do reframe? Who shall remember them, their name and their face, in the din of battle and without a trace? It was Manassas on this hot July day where boys became soldiers and began to pray. And as I stood upon this very ground, a Confederate victory, it was all around. I could not help in wonder of all those who were gone from our hearts, but not from our souls. The Stone House. This very historic structure where you all are sitting right now was used as a field hospital, not for one, but two major Civil War battles. First Battle Manassas, of course, Bull Run, and the Second Battle Manassas, Second Manassas Bull Run, Second Bull Run. Um, and it was used as a field hospital, um, uh, again, in both battles. But during the Second Battle of Manassas, two wounded Union soldiers, Eugene P. P. Gear and Charles Brem, both of the 5th New York Infantry, found their way into one of the upstairs rooms of the Stone House, where they carved their names into the floorboards. Brem survived, but Gear died of his wounds. Their carved names can still be seen in the floorboards today, so please, if you have the opportunity to go up with a docent and see that. In several instances of my Civil War poetry, I give a voice to the stone sentinels of the Civil War, structures and houses that are still standing today as guardians of our past with their own stories to tell. The Stone House. 
I have stood here in the very spot since about 1840s or so, a stony silence to history, you know. Yet there was a war that came to this very place, July of 61, it was of such haste. Before then I will plainly state that my walls once housed a tavern of sorts I do avow. But then on that hot late July afternoon, I could not believe soldiers fighting each other. Oh, this must deceive. I stood here as the cannon did fire and roll like thunder. Oh, it was so dire. Drum beat and battle cries to advance the line. It was a sight that would live for all time. The shelling, the firing did pierce my walls as the Union wounded came to my halls. And oh, I cannot but will try to tell you of that agony of that day of that day gone by, consumed by tragedy. The wounded Federals filled every space to even the mudded floor in the basement place. Blood seeped through the floorboards on every floor and fell upon those too injured for more. It would be a victory for the Confederacy, you see, yet many more battles there would be. So now I must once again tell you this tale when the second battle Manassas did not fail. Yet another Confederate victory in August of 62, more death and destruction that did anew. And of two soldiers I came to hold for a time, for their names are carved in the upstairs pine. Two wounded Union from the 5th New York Infantry, privates they were, and they came to me. One named Charles E. Brem and the other Eugene P. Gear. While in convalescence, they carved their names on the floorboards where they still remain. Eugene would later die after leaving my walls, September 30th in Georgetown Hospital, it was called. Charles would live on until 1909, a life filled with, a life filled with such illness unkind. So here I have stood and here I remain, a stony sentinel to history I refrain. And so I remind you as you all leave, to remember those who came and lived and died between these walls. Oh, so how I cried. The Lost Soul of Manassas. The inspiration for this next poem is a story of Groveton Confederate Cemetery located down the street here on Lee Highway. Um, the Bull Run and Groveton Ladies Memorial Association established in 1867 launched a campaign to recover the Confederate dead from both battles. Um, and there, I believe, a little over 200 unknown uh, Confederate soldiers buried. There are two headstones um, of ones that obviously they did know who they were. There is a white marble obelisk, and again, I urge you to take a look at it. And there's four inscriptions, and I just want to read uh, one of the inscriptions. On the south face of the um, obelisk, it says, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, excuse my Latin, um, and it's a line from the Roman lyrical poet, poet Horace from the Odes. And this line can be roughly translated into English as, it is sweet and glorious to die for one's country. The lost soul of Manassas. Can you help me, I cried out loud. Can you hear me, I avowed. I am here somewhere on this field, you see, buried in pieces, yet not all of me. Twas in July of 1861, a time when the cannons of war had begun. I left my wife in Centerville is where. Her name was Sally May. Oh, she was so fair. In my memory, I do see her golden mane and lips colored like cherry stain. I came here to Manassas during that hot July fight to defend my home from the northern strife. We all rallied and gathered with cheers of delight we would whip the Yankees in this one fight. And so we did right here where I remain. The Confederacy was victorious, yet so many lost in vain. It would take many more battles and death and loss, yet the Yankees would defeat us. It was to our cross. You see, I am still here. I have not left yet to join my comrades with heaven's breath for they could not find all of me and buried me where they could. Here I remain, please help me if you would. With no marker for my grave, it's as if I did not live. I have no name, no face, I'm forced to relive the battle of that July day so long ago. Can you help me, I cried out loud, I want to go. Until that time I will wander these fields and flit about them until it yields my name, my face, my burial place. 
Only then will I see God's face. Can you help me? I cried out loud. Can you hear me? I avowed. This next poem is called Virginia is my home. And it was inspired again by an unknown soldier on the field of Second Manassas in August of 1862. And he's wondering what General Robert E. Lee and General Stonewall Jackson would do to outsmart and outfight the Union General John Pope, which of course they did. And perhaps this soldier was at the deep cut, where for a short time the ammunition was running low for General Jackson's men, and they continued to fight by throwing rocks against the Union. There's a marker on the trail where this event took place. I would again encourage you to take a look and see that. Um, and General James Longstreet would eventually reinforce them, and once again, the Confederates would win yet another battle on Manassas, reinforcing their resolve on the fields of Virginia. Virginia is my home. The bivouac fires that dance and shone bright reflected the heavenly host of light. So many stars that seemed to gleam so close as to reach out and mean that perhaps in the din and roar of the battle yet to be, we may have heaven as our protector. Glory to God, you see. I know it will be the most terrible of battles that will come our way. I know this, for I can clearly say, I see our General Jackson restless in his tent, on his knees to God at the blood that will be spent. In Manassas we now sit, knowing the Union is, is nearby. I sense this battle, we will hear the human cry. Of those so young and eager to fight, smile of victory that seemed to light, their youth and valor none would question, yet so many will fall and see heaven. Our second time through this very field, August 28th of 1862, oh, what will it yield? General Lee in council with Jackson at his side, can it be he will provide? I heard General Longstreet will support our flank in the rear to outfart, outfight and outsmart. Union General Pope, I declare. I plan to, a plan to battle the Union at all cost and push the Union out of Virginia, we are not lost. I have heard on through the ranks that General Lee has said of our Army of Northern Virginia believes we are invincible as to conceive, that even with numbers that are sometimes twice as ours, we will prevail over the Union's cause as we, as that we as the Confederate States of America will reign and will be blessed by God our Supreme. I see General Jackson and Lee bent over the firelight, you see, and I am confident with the morning light we will be in position to fight. And know this now as forever I state, Virginia is my home, my love, and my fate. The next poem is called, What I Saw That Day. And this poem um, was inspired by the letters of J.W. Reed, Private Jesse Walton Reed of the 4th South Carolina Infantry, who wrote several letters to his family between July 23rd and July 30th, 1861. And again, I would encourage you, this is uh, referencing the first Battle of Manassas, and there is a plaque uh, or a marker, battlefield marker, um, with a quote from um, Private Reed talking about his position. So it's, as, as I'm going through this collection, you know, you will see that several positions and parts of this battlefield inspired me. Um, so this is actually one of them. And I'm gonna quote just a little bit of what the letter that he wrote. Quote, the sight of the dead, the cries of the wounded, the thundering noise of the battle can never be put to paper. It must be seen and heard to be comprehended. The dead, the dying, and the wounded, friend and foe all mixed up together, friend and foe embraced in death, some crying for water, some praying their last prayers, some trying to whisper to a friend their last farewell message to their loved ones at home. It's heart trending. I cannot go further. Mine eyes are damp with tears. Although the fight is over, the field is quite red with blood from the wounded and the dead. And this is the inspiration from his letter. What I saw that day. From South Carolina I do hail, and came to Manassas to tell this tale. It came, it's over the battle was won. The enemy has fled, of this it was done. 
but for 10 hours on this one hot July day, 1861, so many caught in the fray. I will, try to t I will try to write to tell you of what I saw, of men and battle things I cannot ignore. My hand is shaking as I try to write to tell you of the horror and fear and fright that heaven above must be weeping to see of what mankind can do in the din and haze of battle this beyond all I knew. It wasn't just the cannon fire that shrieked and screamed by my ears, but the whizzing of musketry that froze my heart from fear. I watched my comrades so young and so bright and young march to their deaths as the battle begun, marching and loading their weaponry as fast as they possibly could to kill the enemy before them right where they stood. The sight of the wounded left screaming in the field, buried beneath the dead that soon would yield. Scores of our youthful friends whose lives were gone, scattered in pieces on this battlefield, I cannot go on. My eyes stung with tears, I tried to help those left behind. I can still hear them crying, help me, I'm dying. Tis a miracle, I say, I made it through to live another day and fight anew. It is to God I leave my fate for he is the one at the golden gate as I await his loving embrace for me to ascend with my comrades and leave this battle place. This next poem is actually uh, one poem from the Nameless and Faceless of the Civil War. I love all my poems, they're all my children. Um, but there was something about this one that's very, very special to me. It's called My Darling Virginia, A Love Letter. And this poem was inspired um, from an actual letter from Union Major General, Major, excuse me, Sullivan Ballou of Rhode Island. And this was a letter that he wrote to his wife, Sarah, on July 14th, 1861, while in Camp Clark, Washington, DC. The eloquence of his writing, it was so beautiful and haunting. And in this poem, my darling Virginia, this unknown soldier is writing to his wife, Virginia, from the battlefield, not knowing if he would survive or ever see his beloved again. And to me, this poem reflects the thousands of letters like this scripted one from a soldier with the fear of death from the battlefield looming over them, men agonizing as each word was written, not knowing if it was going to be their last. So I just wanna read just a snippet from it. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with it. Um, and of course, it's uh, also referenced in Ken Burns' uh, Civil War documentary. Just a little snippet, quote, but, O oh Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they love, I shall always be near you in the garish day, the darkest night, amidst your happiest scenes and gloomiest hours, always, always. And if the soft spring breeze fans your cheek, it shall be my breath, or the cool air cools your throbbing temples, it shall be my spirit passing by. I this magnificently written. My darling Virginia, the soft spring breeze that touched my face, reminiscent, my darling, of your sweet embrace, of times that I remember oh so well, your heart, your love, and our sad farewell. Just know the cause for which we so valiantly fight, left here in battle in the long, long night as we hear the cries of those whose suffering it seems is yet untold, with no comfort that I can share, left only to God to lament and despair. I rest weary with no sleep, the Confederates so close as to weep, to know that my breath now may be my last, as the attack looms close hard and fast. Just know then, darling Virginia, if I do not live, I will still be with you as I beg those to forgive and caress your face with my ghostly breath, what could not be taken from me, not even in death." Again, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> this next poem, because um, it does look I'm gonna have some time here, so I'm very happy about that, um, is called Do Not Weep, Do Not Cry. Uh, this is going to be in my new collection. And this was for all those soldiers on the field of battle, all of them, whose last thoughts were of the loved ones at home. My dearest Catherine, do not weep, do not cry. Listen, my darling, I will tell you why. For although our parting was some time ago, you remain in my heart, you must know. I joined our army to defend our home, our farm, our lives till the end. 
My dearest Catherine, do not weep, do not cry. Listen, my darling, I will tell you why. For though our marches are long and deep, our General Lee will not stop to seek to bring us victory and end this war and for all of us to fight no more. My dearest Catherine, do not weep, do not cry. Listen, my darling, I will tell you why. Tis spring now, and so we find our men in arms in the Virginia pine, a place called the wilderness where General Lee will prevail. He knows his army, we will not fail. We are not so far from our victory of last spring, Chancellorsville, that did bring a total defeat for the Union that time, but in the loss of our Stonewall, so sublime. My dearest Catherine, do not weep, do not cry. Listen, my darling, I will tell you why. For although this battle looms hard and fast into the thicket of the piney mass, oh, such chaos and fighting I never did see. Thousands of men wait, help me please. Artillery and shot and fires around, the screams of men that left me bound. I fell to the ground, I could not speak, the pain in my body that left me weak. My comrades dragged me hither and fro, away from the flames that did grow. And we all heard the screams of those men, union they were as they burned in the glen. My dearest Catherine, do not weep, do not cry. Listen, my darling, I will tell you why. For although my time here on earth will soon be over, tis your eyes I see colored like clover. Just know, my dearest, as I see your faith, I am tethered to you with steel-like grace. I must leave you now, I have no more pain. The light has come for me, I do refrain. And as my soul is lifted to the heavenly host, just know, my dearest Catherine, it was you I loved the most. The next poem, inspired, again, <laughs> all around. <laughs> It was inspired to my visit to the visitor center gift shop <laughs> here, where I saw this handkerchief doll. I left the gift shop and went back again. I was drawn by the story of the doll. And that is, handkerchief dolls during the Civil War were just that. Dolls made from handkerchiefs, fathers, brothers, uncles, were given to children as the men departed for war. Too often these dolls were all that the children possessed to remind them of loved ones who never returned from battle. In this poem, we hear from a father whose daughter gave him her doll to have and to hold and keep him safe. But listen now as the love of the father and his daughter come across amidst the Civil War and as these voices come to life. Anytime that you integrate the voice of a child, it's always very difficult, as you know. The handkerchief doll. As I sat here in the late evening night watching the fading hues of God's delight, the bivouac fires cracked and gleamed as I read your letter like heaven to me. It was August 27th, the eve before the battle plan, when 2nd Manassas would take a stand. It said Centerville on the address, yet the writing was that of a little miss. My heart began to beat, I could not resist. I tore it open and saw, saw stuffed inside a handkerchief doll my Emma May's pride. Dear Papa, I began to read, Mama and I miss you beyond all we can say. Please finish up those Yankees and come home to stay. Mama says it will be a quick fight and you will be home after the strife. She told me the Northern States came to invade our land and that you and others had to take a stand to defend what is ours and what will be this little farm with just us three. Please take my doll I made for you and keep her for all time, for I will be with you, with you always in my heart and in my mind. I will close now, dear Papa, and wait to know that you are coming home and the Yankees are no longer our foe. My head bowed down as I tried not to let others see the stain of tears that almost broke me. I held the letter and doll in my hands and folded carefully to my heart where it would stay to have and to hold and God willing never to part. The call to battle that very next day was one I shall never forget. I was with Stonewall and his brigade, brigade to present our threat. It was while I was fighting in the midst in haze, I heard a whizzing sound that I thought had missed. All those around me, including myself, it was then I was remiss. I felt a burning in my lower back and felled hard to the earth below. 
I sank into the greenest of glen, this I can tell and know. I don't know how long I lay there, for I lost time and space. And then when I finally awoke, I could not move, I cried, and asked for God's grace. The battle was over, I did not what to do. I heard cries from those all around. I realized like so many like me were injured on this ground. Who will come and help us? I prayed to the Almighty in my deepest fear. What seemed like an eternity, a soldier came by and told me help was near. He bent next to me and said, hold on and do not despair. I told him, look beneath me, the green glade of grass was red with my life. I had not much time left to me yet, I begged him to listen to my strife. For I knew I had just a moment or two before the angels would come for me and take me into God's arm to, arms to ascend to him and help me to be free. Just one more thing, please, I asked the soldier to do. Go into my pocket and find the letter from my darling, the one I love so true. He reached into my pocket with the letter and opened it with care. And like a miracle from heaven, not a stain of blood did appear. The little handkerchief doll was unharmed and looked exactly the same, pristine and loved just as it came. It was exactly like she had given me to protect me from this fight. I knew I had received a blessing from the Almighty's might. Please go now and tell my Emma May she did protect me on this day. Perhaps not from the bullet that took me, you see, but lent me into God's loving arms. Oh, he's waiting for me. Last poem I'm going to read is the signature poem, My Gift to the National Park Service. This is uh, an extraordinary, um, I'm going to say poem just of how it came to me. I was walking the trail, the stone bridge by the Bull Run Creek. Uh, this is in, while I was in residency, of course. And uh, the, the, the creek was on my left side, and the forestry here was on my right. And as I was walking, and this was the last poem I had written while I did my um, residency here, it was absolute silence on that trail. Uh, I didn't hear any water running. There were no animal sounds, no birds, no crickets, nothing. This seemed very quiet to me. And it was so beautiful. Um, it was fall. You could see some of the leaves turning. They were awash with color. The sun was glinting through the forest side. And then all of a sudden, as I stood still, a leaf just fell at my feet. And at that moment, I began to wonder where the silence here was so vastly contrasted with the horror of the fighting and suffering of all those soldiers so long ago. It's for them and all of those who are unknown that I dedicate this poem today and always. Rise up all ye Manassas, rise, take your place among the skies, for in these fields among those unknowns, there are stories I know that are yet untold. Whispers of valor and elan that you did make, stories of friendships you did not forsake. Rise up, all ye Manassas, rise. Take your place along God's side. These lush fields colored in magnificent green were once killing fields of the obscene. A battlefield where the country divided and fought, and now where unity shall forever be taught. Rise up, all ye Manassas, rise. I have heard your silent cries. Whispers of those left behind without a name or a face. So many I know here in this place. Names like the deep cut, unfinished railroad to witness here and there. And the stone house Henry Hill, oh, filled with such despair. With each step across these hallowed grounds, be mindful a soldier may have found a final resting place too young to die, yet so many did is how I cry. Rise up, all ye Manassas, rise. Your presence here is so defined. Just walk the stone bridge along the riverbed, the one called Bull Run that long ago bled. Stop and listen to the forest sounds and for a moment become one with them for all their sacrifice and so many men. Rise up, all ye Manassas, rise. Take thy brethren by your side. And hand in hand for those who ascended to the Almighty's throne, let us never forget those lost and unknown. Thank you all very much. And 
as part of uh, today's presentation, I will call uh, Liz up here to the podium. And, uh, and I'm going to have my husband Jim come up too, because he's oh. my husband Jim. Well, just to help you hold it. Yeah, Excellent. to help you hold it. Excellent. Just in case it needs two people, because it's a little bulky. <laughs> And I want to present wow. my gift to the National Park Service, wow. uh, the poem Rise Up All Ye Manassas Rise. And this, I understand, will be in headquarters. Is that yeah. correct here at the park? Yeah. So this is my gift uh, for, to the Park Service and uh, the extraordinary experience I had while artist in residence here um, has stayed with me to this day and has inspired me to continue my poetry, continue working, and try to um, obviously continue, give a voice to those who don't have one. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. That was awesome.